nice to have you back. Well, good morning, Tabernacle. I hate to, I hate to break up this fellowship, but uh, we need to get started in Sunday school. Welcome to Sunday school. We continue in our study uh, of uh, Christ's return and and, and uh, living with the end in mind. And today we're going to be studying, know what's coming, what to expect, what to look for, what will be the signs of, of taking place. And Jesus was had just finished the Passover with his with his disciples. And uh, they were walking through, away from the temple complex. And they were headed toward the Mount, the Mount of Olives. And, of course, they were probably a little noisy. They were talking and laughing and going on with each other. And one of the disciples called Jesus' attention to the temple and said, Look, look at the temple. Isn't it a beautiful place? Huge stones on top of huge stones. There was the temple. That signified the presence of their God in Jerusalem. And Jesus had before said, had, had said, and they were, they were questioning him about this. He says, you know, uh, we'll tear down the temple and in three days I'll build it back. But he wasn't talking about that temple. He was talking about this temple when he was sharing that with them. And they had questions because they, they, Jesus said times were coming when he would no longer be with them. And they, were, they needed to learn all they could learn before he left them. And so, you know, Jesus and his disciples were doing much the same as we do. They were having Christian fellowship. You know, living in, in the presence of God is not something we're going to find at a future date. Can you tell me why? God is always present with his people. Now, when I say his people, who am I talking about? Born-again believers. Now, it's his people. Now, why, why can we say that God is with us all the time, whether we realize it or not? Who lives within our heart and in our body and in our soul that's the presence of God? The Holy Spirit. So there's not any time that you can ever be anywhere that you're away from God. He is always there. We have to be real careful where we take him. I am ashamed of some of the places that I've taken the Holy Spirit and I have asked forgiveness for that, and he's forgiven me, but it still, does, it still causes me to reflect that I have to be real careful where I've taken the Holy Spirit. And they began to raise questions of Jesus. He is, talk, he is talking about the end was coming. Now, what he's talking about with them is not the end of times that we know that comes with the Great Tribulation and his returning. He was talking about the coming of the Romans that were going to... Uh, destroy the temple and its environs in A.D. 70. Now, it, that, that had happened one time before. In uh, 167 B.C., the temple was destroyed, and it was built back. But th this, was, this was what was, Jesus, Jesus was a realist. This was what was on his mind. He was trying to get his disciples ready for what was to come. And it's not, it was not going to be a pleasant time. Uh, there are times when we'll find that we go through as we walk with Jesus. There won't be pleasant times. The destruction of the temple. Now, what Christ was warning them about was the fact that the, uh, the Romans did not like the Jews. Because they were not only were they stiff-necked people, they were rebellious people. Even uh, when they were made... Uh, uh, serfs under the hand of the Romans and they had the Romans in Jerusalem. They were, they were not a free people and they kind of they uh, kind of pushed back against the Romans. And one of the reasons that Christ wasn't accepted as the uh, savior of the world, the Messiah, what were they looking for? They were looking for a Messiah that would save them from the heavy hand of the Roman Empire. That they would take away the Romans and free the Jews again, give them freedom again. They were not looking for someone who would come, go to a cross, and die for their sins. We did a study in cults one time, and it said that the Orthodox Jew does not believe that they need a Savior. They still say, well, we've got the uh, 
sacrifice sacrifice system. And in, in, when you study the end times, you find out that's the daily sacrifice is one of the things that they took away from the Jews. And it came to be part of that uh, abomination that they talk about. Think about this. There's a huge Roman army moving toward Jerusalem. Now the people there know that army's coming. And they're going to lay siege to Jerusalem. And uh, they're going to destroy the temple and its environs. They're going to kill thousands of Jews and people who are inside the city. And Jesus knows that's going to happen. So he's getting ready to tell them what they need to do and how they need to be observant of what's going on. Not stand there kind of uh, in awe and watch it come, but prepare for it and when the time comes, move. He was concerned that his followers would live faithfully and be prepared for whatever is to come. Now, you know, today in our time, we could say that we're in these same kind of times that the Jews were back when they were facing with the Romans. We're in very, very unsettled times. There's chaos and wars and rumors of wars and all kinds of things that uh, Daniel said would be there in the latter days and Jesus said there would be there in the latter days. There are all these things taking place with us that took place with the Jews in Jerusalem at AD 70. Now think about this. As Jesus prepared his disciples to face what was coming, the Holy Spirit today prepares us to face what we're, what we're seeing here. Now God says, I'm in control. I've got it. I can take care of it. But I have heard Christians that I know that are, that are deeply loyal to their Savior sit around and say, well, you know, you know what, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, we're going to have to suffer this, we're going to have to... You know, that doesn't matter if God's in control because he'll never leave you or forsake you or never allow you to go through something that you can't go through, never allow you to have a temptation without giving you an out, never stop protecting you, never stop providing for you, Never stop growing your salvation as you work toward the time that you go to meet him in heaven. So why do we worry? We expend great amounts of energy worrying about what might happen instead of spending great amounts of energy sharing Christ with others so they can, they can know that they're as secure as we are. So why do we do that? Our adversary uses that to attack us, to seek to defeat us. If he can't have you, if you're already a follower of Christ or you're going to have an opportunity soon to be a follower of Christ, if he cannot stop you from doing that, then what he wants to do is destroy your testimony. So we must be very, very observant and careful of what we do because there are hundreds of people in this community that don't know Christ as their Savior. Five miles in any direction. There are people who don't know Jesus. You say, oh, come on, Tom. America is a great Christian nation, you know. But then if that is the case, why are they all these people that don't know Christ? Where do we fall, fail? Where do we fall short without introducing them to living our lives in such a way that they want to do the same thing? So here he is. He's got the disciples around him, and he starts to talk to them. He said, uh, when you therefore see the abomination of desolation... Spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. When you therefore see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place. Something obvious is obviously about to happen. And uh, what, would the, what would God uh, consider an abomination? There's a, there's a list in the Bible that he gives us as this is abomination, that's an abomination. Uh, think about this. As he looks at this, as he talks about the spoken of Daniel the prophet, uh, perhaps they're alluding to the temple, which they consider that consecrated and holy ground, and it represents the presence of God in Jerusalem, their God in Jerusalem. Uh, 
the desolation in the mind of Jesus was probably the Roman army coming because he knew what was going to happen. And the disciples were much like we are today. We speculate. We always speculate. And we sit around and sometimes we do nothing when we should be moving and doing something. We should be seeking God's will and know that we won't be caught by surprise if this does come to place. The abomination is a detestable, a detestable thing. Uh, it would probably refer to idolatry. Now, what was unclean to the Jews? Anybody? How about anything that has a cloven hoof? Think about this. Antichus, Antichus Epiphanes desecrated the temple by slaughtering a pig on the altar. The pig was an unclean animal to the Jews. This, this would, really, it would really anger them, but it would also really depress them because what it had done is it would make the holy place unholy in the sight of God. And the Romans did that. You know, the temple had been destroyed twice. Well, actually, the third temple was uh, the one that Jesus, Jesus was in, but the, it was destroyed uh, by uh, the Romans in 168-167 B.C. And thousands of people were, were killed. Think, think, think about what we might be facing in the future. Does that prey on your mind? Or do you, are you able to grasp God's promises to us? You know, we look at this thing going on in, in, uh, uh, over in Russia and Ukraine and how many people are being, are being killed and dying over there. Uh, we look at the unrest and the seemingly uh, destruction of our own country from then. Nikita Khrushchev says, we will not ever have to come over and take your country from you. Your country will die from within. And that may be a prophecy not made by a, a Christian, but a prophecy that may be true. We'll die of our own doings. And we're living in a time like that. So what should, what should we be doing? We should be preparing ourselves to share with others that God still loves them, God still is in control, there's nothing that happens on this world that he that does not permit or cause to, cause to happen. And he said, uh, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can take you out of my hand. All of these promises are still true, and God still inhabits the, 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 the temple, which is my temple here, your temple, in the form of his Holy Spirit, just as he did before. So there's not much change with our relationship with God, but the culture and the world we lived in is changing pretty drastically, isn't it? Well, the Jews were fixing to have a change uh, when the Romans came. So here they are. They know the Romans are coming. It's a huge army, and it can't move very fast, so they know it's coming. And he's trying to prepare the disciples to be, be ready to move at a moment's notice. Whosoever readeth this, let him understand. Uh, be alert. Uh, watch to see what's coming. Know what you will do if it does, but be alert. Jesus not, does not respond to our concerns and questions with his word of truth. <laughs> let me say that again. Jesus does respond to our questions uh, with truth from his word. The world... Uh, Marked by wickedness, has no respect for the holy things of God or his people. You know, we haven't been persecuted as some of the followers of Christ have been around the world. But I think we're going to have a day that's coming, even here in America. When, when Korea and other places like that start sending missionaries to America because there's a need here, then we need to stand up and, and take stock of what we're going on. Holy relics, religious symbols may fall, but God never fails. The word of God is given to prepare us for future events 
both those we face in the now and other things that are yet to come. So are we preparing? Are we being attentive? Are we being alert? Are we listening to God to hear what he has to say? Instead of worrying about what might happen by doing something that, that could profit those that are, that are walking with Christ rather than, than being. And, and some of the folks that I know that are good Christians, and I know I've known them a long time, have been so negative about what's going on right now. I will not be able to do this. We'll not be able to do this. We, 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 we won't be able to, to, to go anywhere because the gas will be so high. Uh, if, if things fail, then we'll not be able to eat because, you know, we'll be able to get groceries and stuff like that. And, and God says, hey, I've got all of that in control. I have my hand in it. Just trust me. You'll get through this. I imagine that during the World Wars uh, and in the early... 20th century, uh, we were probably pushed upon by the, 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 the fact that there could be a war, there would be a war, people would die and so forth. But yet, God brought us through it. And he brought us through it through the two Christian nations, the U.S. and Great Britain. And Christianity in that and the prayers of those nations were what brought us through the wars Winston Churchill took one of our, our senators into a building and down to a basement. And in that basement where there were benches and there were about a dozen people in there and they were praying. And he says, this is what's going to win the war. We do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's somebody down here praying for God's leadership and his hand on us. Are we praying? Are we spending enough time on our knees or even in thought that that might be what we need to do? Then he says, this is what you do. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which which is in the field return to pay clothes. And woe unto uh, them that are with child and to them that suck in those days. We pray ye that your flight is not be in the winter and neither on the Sabbath day. You know, I've seen the flat top houses over in the Middle East. They don't have these nice gable houses like we do. They don't have snow. But they, a lot of the time, the family uses the top of their house for different things. What, what, can, what can you remember out of the Old Testament that the, was used the top of the house for? Can you think? Well, think about a prophet that God brought to a woman and they built him a room on top of her house. And they use it as a patio. They use it as a meeting place. They use it to eat. They use it to sleep in the, in the summertime when it's, when it's hot. And they're meeting, they use the top of their houses because they're accessible. Uh, but which prophet was... was Housed on the top of the widow's house. I'm going to let you guys, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to let you guys look it up. Go look it up and see. If you're interested in knowing which prophet did that, it's in the Old Testament. You'll see. But he says, if you're up on the top of the house, all you have to do is go downstairs. He said, don't even stop to bring anything out of the house because the danger is so close, it could be deadly. When you move, you move instantly, you move fast. You move away from the danger and, and uh, keep on moving. Neither let him, which is in the field, return back to take his clothes. Now, you know, the, the, the garments that they wear was an inner garment, an outer garment, and a lot of times a cloak. And, and when they went to work in the fields, uh, the, the wet season was the wintertime in, in Israel. But they went to work in the fields, they would lay aside their outer garments well, they may not even take them with them. They'd leave them in their house. But the, it, traditionally, they wore their outer garments when they were out and in public and around people. Uh, so he said, don't even go do that. Don't grab it. Go in and grab your clothes. Now, just leave and leave quickly. He says, woe to them that are with child or to them that give suck in those days. 
you know, if you had to leave and leave quickly and go somewhere and you weren't allowed to go back and get anything out of your home, it would be tough on a pregnant lady to be able to move quickly and keep up with the others. And how about those with very young children? You know, it'd be hard to, to if, you, if you had to carry them, uh, it would make you weary in a hurry. If you had to lead them along, you, you probably wouldn't be moving too fast and they would get weary in a hurry. He said, don't, don't stop, get away. Your life depends upon it. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. The winter times are the times of rain in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, the rivers are swollen, the streams are swollen, they're really hard to navigate or even to cross. And you could be held back into an area where you could actually be captured uh, by the invading army. And he was thinking about this. He was trying to prepare his disciples who he knew would continue the work of the church after his crucifixion. He's trying to prepare them to be ready to move so that there would be a witness uh, after his death. So he says, you know, pray that it doesn't take place in the, in the winter. You have to have extra clothing. You won't be able to cross the rivers. Uh, it'd be tough places to hide, uh, he said. And, and neither on the Sabbath days. Now you remember... When Jesus and his disciples were out walking through a cornfield on the Sabbath day, some of his disciples reached over and snapped off an ear of corn and ate it. And some of the folks from the temple said, Hey, why do they, what's this a Sabbath? You don't do that. And uh, uh, there was a lot of restrictions on what you could do and couldn't do on the Sabbath. And uh, Jesus told them, Well, the Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. Sabbath day is the day that you didn't work. On the day before the Sabbath day, you prepared your meals and everything that you were going to have the next day. And, uh, hey, no refrigeration, no stuff like that. They prepared the meals, and it, and it God made it good. If they obeyed, he, 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 made, he made his promises. But you don't, there's so many restrictions on the Sabbath. You had to, you had to decide whether you were going to lay aside those restrictions in your haste to be away or whether or not you were going to still hold to the teachings of the Sabbath. And quite possibly, it could be your end. Because the, the Roman army killed thousands upon thousands of Jews and occupants in, in Jerusalem when, when they uh, laid siege to the city. Now, he's going to say, now, this, this, this is going to come to an end. But this is how it's going to come to an end. This is what you can expect. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not, uh, was not since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor even shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh to be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, you think he's talking about the end of time. And he may be, and he may be thinking along that same line as the end of time prophecy. But what he says here is it's not... For there then shall be the tribulation, great tribulation. He said, for then shall be great tribulation. Because you're going to experience this in your lifetime. And it's not going to be the end of time. It's going to be what's coming in the days. And if you're alive, you'll, you'll be a part of this. And he says, it's this, trip, this type of tribulation, this, the siege of the city, they're not letting any people in, not letting any people out, not letting any provisions in. They're dying of starvation. They're dying of, of disease. Uh, when they try to escape, the Romans were killing them. He said, you know, this is something that you've not experienced since the beginning of time. Except these days be shortened. There should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be sharp. Herod Agrippa, the regional king, and the Roman emperor Vespasian and Titus, military commander of the Roman forces, made political, military, and a strategic decision to stop the siege and leave Israel and leave Jerusalem. They realized that not only were they they're, they're killing off their tax base and killing off uh, the things that helped support the Romans where they're there that uh, if, if, if they didn't have anybody left 
which is what was going to happen if they continued to do what they were doing, then it, uh, it, it wouldn't be to their profit. It wouldn't be profitable for them to do that. God's chosen people, the elect, there would not be any of those left in Jerusalem. So God caused them to make a decision to withdraw. Now, that didn't stop all the things that were going on. It, it went on for a period of time. But, it, it, but it, it did stop it in time that it didn't make a desolate place out of the, the city of God. There would, there would have been nobody left in the city of God. Nobody buried the dead. Nobody, that, God stopped it before then. And, and he said to his disciples, you must be prepared. You must be prepared. When you see it coming... Don't stop to observe it. Leave immediately. Don't take anything with you. Just take the family and run. You know, when it's said in the first of our scripture that, uh, and I'm going to go back and read it. When it talked about, uh, as in the time of Daniel the prophet, it said, let them that which be in Judea Flee to the mountains. They fled to the mountains and the caves of uh, the mountains, just as David and his 600 soldiers did when Saul was, was, was chasing him. They fled across the Jordan River to the city of Pelah on the east side of the Jordan, outside of Israel, the, the, the uh, nation of Israel, to get away with what was coming. Hundreds of them fled, and, and all, but still thousands of them were killed just like is being done today. Thousands of people are being killed. So where can we glean, glean from this lesson today? We can claim that we need to be prepared. We need to be alert. We don't need to sit back and wait for the catastrophe or whatever's coming to come to us. We need to be prepared to do as God calls us to do. He saved a remnant in Jerusalem after this attack by the Romans. However, they did destroy most of the city and they destroyed the temple. Now, some of the, the scriptures that we read this morning can pertain just as much to the end of time as it did to the time that Jesus was trying to prepare his disciples to be prepared for, get them ready for and oftentimes they take the prophecy or the, the, the scriptures that's in Matthew here uh, and they, they uh, apply it to the end times. But that wasn't what Jesus was talking about. He said it's coming and it's coming quickly and it's going to be in your lifetime. So you know that uh, the, the second coming of Christ is coming and it's probably coming quicker now than it ever has. And there are people around us, there are people in our families, there are people in our spheres of influence that don't know Jesus as their personal Savior, have never made that relationship, has never accepted his free gift of salvation that we, that we know now the time is growing short. The time is now. The need is immediate. So what we should, should we be doing? We should be seeking to share Christ with them as soon as possible. I had, a, I had a young black fella, I was pumping gas, and uh, he, we were pumping, I was on one side, and he was on the other side, and we were pumping, and he was singing a, a hymn. And I said, I like your song, and he, and he sticks his head out around a big grin on his face, and said, are you a Christian? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, let's sing it together. And I said, all right. So we set it to gas pump and sang a hymn. And we had a good time. People were just looking at us like we were crazy. But, you know, something like that is going to touch the heart of somebody. They're going to look at you and say, well, how can you do what you do? How can you not worry about what's going on in America today? God's in control. He's promised he would be. He has never failed on a promise that he's given us. Why should we believe you start now? Why should we believe that he would start now? So be alert, 
Now, my prayer for you this week, every one of you, now you're probably going to not like this, but I want you to have an opportunity to share Jesus with somebody. Share his love. And it, it will come in the most inauspicious ways. Somebody will be, will be in a grocery store. Uh, somebody will be at, at a gas station. You might be, you might be anywhere, and, and an opportunity will come here. And you'll know it's an opportunity, and, and it's up to you to, to, to take the opportunity to share the love of Christ. So that's a lot of these things that we hear might come to pass in the, in the end of times will not be something that will destroy these people's lives. Think about this. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. For the believer, that's worship. For the non-believer, that's surrender. They're going to surrender to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. They'll know he's Christ, but they will not have made a relationship with him. So we need to be about immediately sharing, irregardless of what we expect, if whether we get rejected or not, it doesn't matter. We need to share because that's going to, that's going to a witness never goes unheeded in the life of a person. It either convicts them that they need the Lord or it, 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 it makes them angry that you would think that they needed that. So don't let that bother you. Just share Jesus. Share his love. He died on the cross to love you, and he died on the cross to love And he died on the cross to love all of them. So let's, let, let's, let's be cognizant of what's all going around us. Take every opportunity to share. And uh, one of the greatest experiences that, we, that you'll ever have, aside from your salvation, and guys, maybe marrying your wife will be the opportunity you have to share and see the Holy Spirit lead someone to Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for Jesus. All of that, Lord, is, is why we're here. We're here to worship, and to lift up your name. And Lord, we're here to be about your business. Lord, we ask that you... Take us and use us. There are people that will be in our lives this week that don't know Jesus. And if you came today and we met you in the class, they would, uh, unless they, they gave their heart to Christ during the great tribulation, not the tribulation that Jesus was talking about here, but the great tribulation at the end of time, they'll be forever separated from you. And we wouldn't want that to happen to anybody. So Lord, help us to be uh, alert Help us to be sensitive to the needs of others. Help us to, to, to watch and wait. And if an opportunity presents itself, just go with it. The Holy Spirit will put in your mouth and in your mind and in your heart the words and things you need to say. All you have to be is available. So, Lord, if, as we get the chance this week to share the love of God with someone, uh, Lord, to help us to take that opportunity. Forgive us sometimes, Lord, because we're going to fail you. And uh, we need your forgiveness. We also need your love and your mercy and your grace. And you lavish that on us uh, so freely. Thank you again for this day. Be with uh, the services that are to come. Watch over and keep us. Continue to bless us. Continue to, to grow us up in the faith. And we'll give you the praise and honor and glory of it all. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.